so 9th edition is on its way towards revisiting the factions and providing us new codexes. And since my last video on Chaos Space Marine potentials was well received, I figured I would make another video where I can criticize where we are and talk about what I would like to see for another favorite faction of mine that seems to be underappreciated, the Tyranids. And the journey that was writing this script sent me down a rabbit hole of interesting potentials and game mechanic solutions, turning this video into a bit of a long man. So get yourself some plastic to paint or some biomass to eat. Let's get into the state of Tyranids. Plus, 9th edition potentials. I started collecting Tyranids back when their line was last refreshed, around 6th edition. What drew me to them was, in part, their unique aesthetic, but it was also their identity as a faction. Where all the other factions are soldiers and warriors fighting for causes, the Tyranids are a monstrous predatory force, and undoubtedly are the most alien of the 40k faction roster. And my biggest gripe with their rules handling as a faction revolves around that representation. The faction that is the most alien has a rule set that is fairly uncreative, not pushing the boundaries of the game's restrictions. So I invite you to put your game design slash game mechanics hat on and consider the following as we explore why this is. As I've stated before, 40k is a game of rules and exceptions to those rules, and those exceptions are used to allow factions to flex and showcase their unique qualities. Here's a simple example. The core rules state units which fall back cannot shoot. Ultramarines, however, can fall back and shoot, with a hit disadvantage, to represent their tactical flexibility and pragmatic style of warfare. So what about the Tyranids? Well, at the most fundamental level, they occupy the unique position of being the alien horror of alien horrors the 40k universe has to offer. And to keep the terms clear, alien referring to being unfamiliar and disturbing, and horror referring to fear, shock, or disgust. Essentially, horror derived from being alien. And in the case of Tyranids, what makes them scary is that they are very alien. In fact, they are the most alien, both in terms of aesthetic and in terms of place of origin, since they are the only faction not originating from the known galaxy. This begs the question, what kind of rules representation would be suitable for a faction which is horrific? Well, for starters, it isn't leadership penalties. Because of how 8th edition and by extension 9th edition's morale mechanics function, it makes focusing on morale-based casualties as a primary goal to be counterintuitive in almost all cases. It's much simpler and typically more effective to put those resources towards removing models with attacks than to try executing attacks and set up morale debuffs, which also leaves you in a much worse position if the enemy player circumvents the morale test. And ultimately, because it's not more threatening than conventional offensive strategies, it makes the specialization in leadership penalty stacks to be inherently less intimidating, and it fails to evoke fear. I know it's usually applied to video games, but the term ludonarrative dissonance comes to mind, where the game mechanics and narrative fail to be in alignment. Horror game design and fear-inducing game mechanics fail if all they are trying to do is make the in-game characters scared. It means diddly squat if my guardsmen are afraid, especially if I have the tools to keep them in line. The measurement of quality as it relates to horror game design and fear-inducing game mechanics is how well the mechanics instill fear within the player. For a single-player first-person exploration game, this can be achieved with environmental storytelling, sound design, atmosphere, shocking visuals, the list goes on. But obviously, for a PvP, tabletop, turn-based strategy game, the same mechanisms can't be relied upon although creepy visuals are certainly appreciated. Here is the route to evoking fear in PvP turn-based strategy games. If a particular unit or faction is supposed to stagger your opponent, they should be able to leverage powerful, unique exceptions. Exceptions which, when your opponent understands, tears down the walls they thought they could stand safely behind. Mechanics to keep enemies from falling back, or to turn off a unit's auras or invulnerable saves, are all excellent examples. So with all that clarified and my stance on fear-based game mechanics stated, the rule exceptions available to the Tyranids toolkit falls far, far short of where they should be for a faction that is not only supposed to evoke horror, but which are also the most alien, which effectively defines them as being the least understood, the least relatable, and the furthest away from the box which qualifies a faction as normal, that is relative to the Imperium slash humanity as standard. This is the crux of my position on the Tyranids presently. But it's not all doom and gloom. Blood of Bale did provide some pretty great backend tools for the Tyranids, which speak to my points mentioned, 
providing them with some pretty unique exceptions, with a few stratagems standing out in particular, and the introduction of the adaptive physiologies pivoting the toolkit in a better direction. But in spite of how good Blood of Bale's supplement was for the Tyranids, it was still just a supplement, one which rests on the rather weak foundation of the Tyranid Core Codex, the weaker areas being the army-wide rules, sub-faction traits, and the units themselves. It is these areas which have the most potential for change as the Tyranid C 9th edition rules support, and it's what will be the main focus of this video. Let's start with the army-wide rules. Although I find the core changes of 9th edition to have vastly improved the game experience, not all factions and their related mechanics took to them well, and the Tyranids army-wide ability Synapse is one of those cases. If you don't know, or if you need a refresher, Synapse is an ability which grants units near a Synapse unit the ability to auto-pass morale tests. At its core, it's an ability that is generally more valuable for units with larger model counts, since they are the units more at risk to morale casualties. And this held true to a pretty dramatic degree in 8th edition, since the morale system meant that killing approximately half a large unit would cause the remaining half to flee. But with 9th edition's changes to the morale system, Synapse only provides a fraction of the value it once offered. So as you can see, there is room for an ability rework here, a good potential for it I reckon. As far as what it could be, well I've arrived at two outcomes, one that is more conservative and one that is a bit more boundary pushing. And I think I will start with the latter because it's more fun. Remember when we all learned how 9th edition was changing coherency? Specifically, how models and large units need to stay within coherency of two models instead of one. It's a change I do appreciate since it lessens the abuse of conga line style formations. However, I think this presents an opportunity to provide some of that unique alien horror sensibility, as if any faction does not need to keep its large troops in a restrictive formation to maintain order, it's the Tyranids. And from what I can gather, that's what the spirit of the Synapse rule is trying to evoke anyways. But if it were too strong of a benefit as an army-wide rule, a certain high fleet in particular does come to mind, one which has a poor offering of rules and deserves to be able to push the utility of its swarms better than any of the other high fleets. That's high fleet Hydra. Now for my conservative take. I believe it's totally justifiable for Synapse to provide stat mitigating effects for degrading stats. As I already illustrated, Synapse has always only ever offered a perk which benefits large model count units, and since that is a less valuable ability in 9th edition, why not let monsters double their wounds characteristic for the purpose of determining stats? From a fluff point of view, it seems pretty fitting, since Synapse at its core is a connection which focuses behavior. And if you want to rein it in, it could even be a fourth, smaller bubble within the many bubbles that encompass the Synapse bubble. Another likely potential in store for Tyranids, I think, will be a Combat Doctrine equivalent ability. The pattern thus far is pretty clear. Space Marines, Angels of Death, Combat Doctrines, Sisters, Acts of Faith, Sacred Rites, Necrons, Reanimation, and Command Protocols. Heck, even Grey Knights were given their Tides of the Warp. We can see that the former abilities are constant and the latter are variable, meaning they shift and or change in some way. I don't believe there's currently a term for it, so I've decided to refer to these as variable army-wide abilities. And so it seems obvious that this is the new faction philosophy for the 9th edition era, to provide factions with a variable army-wide ability that mechanically provides players opportunities to make interesting decisions, which results in the game feeling better. So with that in mind, what can we expect for the Tyranids? Well, to be honest, it's hard to predict the details of a system's mechanics, other than it will likely be variable. But I thought about it, and I arrived at something which is, in my opinion, pretty stellar. And to be clear, I mean that as a concept. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here. Like with any rules mechanic, its quality will depend on the execution. But the concept is one I feel is worth sharing. Keeping things focused on explaining the system, here is the general function. Arranged are a series of nodes linked together kind of like a skill tree. Each of these nodes houses a rule, and altogether it forms what I call a hive command matrix. Similar to other variable army-wide abilities, at the start of the battle, allow the player to select one of the two starting nodes. Then in each subsequent command phase, the player can choose to leave the current node for an adjacent one. And with each node providing a rule or ability, the Tyranids have a dynamic system that allows for some interesting decisions to be made, 
and allows players to think like the hive mind. Should they encounter a problem, they can adapt to overcome it. While I wouldn't say the sub-faction rules for Tyranids are as generally low scoring as that of 8th edition Codex Chaos Space Marines, there are some clear winners. Namely, Kraken and Kronos, which outright have invalidated the other high fleets for pretty much the entirety of 8th edition's run. And it's not too hard to see why. Can I, uh, can I show you something? Here I have compiled the Tyranid sub-factions into a spreadsheet. I find it quite useful when reviewing mechanics to break things down in this manner, as it makes it much easier to analyze, compare, and contrast. Across the top row I have arranged each of the high fleets. Below that I have given them a label based on what I have determined to be their quintessential quality. Leviathan is the well-connected high fleet. Being the newest high fleet to emerge, it makes sense to me they have evolved a stronger synaptic network. Kraken is the fast high fleet since they are known for being extremely fast. Behemoth is the most aggressive. They were the first high fleet to enter the galaxy and serve as a nice foil to Leviathan. Gorgon is known for being the most adaptable with relation to their toxins. Jormungandr is the tunneling high fleet, Hydra is all about the endless swarms, and Kronos is the shooty high fleet with a splash of anti-warp thrown in. As with any grouping of sub-factions, each high fleet provides an ability that incentivizes different game mechanics, which ideally should represent their abilities and behavior in the narrative. In the case of 8th edition Codex Tyranids, this is technically something it achieves but fails to balance. We can distill these abilities into categories to identify what mechanisms they are enhancing or encouraging. We have Defense for Leviathan, Movement for Kraken, Charging, which equates to Fighting for Behemoth, Fighting for Gorgon, Defense for Jormungandr, Fighting for Hydra, and Shooting for Kronos. And the invalidation is becoming clear. Considering the context of the Tyranids toolkit, that being their load-bearing troop choice gene stealers have an ability which allows them to advance and charge, which is an extremely powerful exception, and that the Tyranids have a psychic power, which can allow any unit to advance and charge, together results in Kraken's movement boost effectively making them the best high fleet for fighting. As in the majority of cases, the hardest part of executing combat is getting there, and unfortunately, the other fight-focused high fleet adaptations fail to measure up. So considering all that, while Behemoth does have a perk to increase charge reliability, Kraken's boost to movement essentially means they are going to be charging from a closer distance, with the exception of charging from reserves. And yes, this would only apply to Kraken units, which advance and then charge, but I classified Gene Stealers as a load-bearing troop choice for that reason. If you can execute a first turn charge with a unit as potent as Gene Stealers, you create a massive problem for your opponent due to the reality that there are more subsequent consequences that come from being in melee combat. The Kraken player will have a substantial advantage over the Behemoth player in this regard, and it doesn't help that Blood of Bale also give Kraken access to the same ability via a psychic power that has a low cost and unlimited range. Gorgon's perk isn't bad at all, providing a valuable combat buff, one that synergizes with Gene Stealers, specifically their Rending Claws, which can be further bolstered with the Toxin Sax upgrade. However, while Gorgon's Gene Stealers are deadlier in combat, they have a much harder time getting there. The same problem applies to Hydra, who also have a pretty potent perk, but is much, much more restrictive, as it provides a valuable ability that is harder to leverage, and only to high model count units. Jormungandr's adaptation also stacks up pretty poorly. Like Leviathan's, it's a defensive perk, but its restriction requires you to not advance or charge, and flying units can't claim its benefit. You would think for all those restrictions the perk would be pretty powerful, but it's not. Which when you think about, absolutely sucks for Behemoth, Gorgon, Jormungandr, and Hydra fans. Like with Chaos Space Marines, I honestly think the case can be made for maltreatment, or at the very least cruel neglect of those players. But that isn't the point of this video. That being what it is, it's likely when a 9th edition codex comes out for the nids, it will enhance their sub-faction rules, and bring them to the two-factor standard that seems to be set with the late 8th edition and early 9th edition era codexes. But more importantly, the secondary perks or reworks need to enhance the foundation of the High Fleet sub-factions while speaking to their thematic qualities, so I will close out this section by blasting through some choices I consider to be appropriate. Leviathan is the face of the Tyranids, and it seems to me they should be the jack of all trades High Fleet. Synapse is their specialty, so give units within Synapse the Space Marine banner effect to shoot or fight on death. 
It speaks to the flavor text. Kraken already has two perks. It's the fastest high fleet, and it can uniquely flex gene stealers and broodlords better than any other high fleet. The monsters of Behemoth should hold some weight. If their thing is aggression, perhaps offer bonuses to better reflect that. You know what other sub-faction has an aggression problem? The Blood Angels who have an obscenely good trait for melee in plus one to advance and charge rolls and plus one to wound in combat. If their adaptation offered a melee perk of that magnitude, it would finally give Behemoth, the OG High Fleet, some ground to stand on when compared to Kraken. Gorgon's perk to reroll wound rolls of one should probably extend to all attacks made in shooting and fighting, since it's actually supposed to be that way. Also an aspect of Gorgon that currently has no representation is their ability to flex Sporecaster organisms, which in lore they are particularly noteworthy of using. So something like a stratagem to allow Gorgon to push the mortal wound potency of things like Toxicreens and Venomthropes would probably go a long way. If the flavor text of Tunnel Network states that Jormungandr attack from tunnels making them difficult to target, I would posit they should definitely have a stronger defensive perk, especially for having all those restrictions. And if they lose their defense for advancing or charging, I think it's reasonable for units which burrow to gain a bonus to their charge. Also, I think it's worth considering that Jormungandr are the it came from below flavor of Tyranid. They should be flexing that a lot more, and given how all the other Hive fleets have a pretty defined lane, Jormungandr are, in my opinion, fertile ground to be the utility focused Tyranid subfaction. For instance, I think there could be some mechanisms to slink back underground and return to the battlefield on a subsequent turn, or the ability to set up reserve denial zones, and the ability to charge and ignore Overwatch since they are underground. All of these mechanics could be tied to units that burrow, which now better encourages the burrowing units High Fleet Jormungandr are known for. Where to begin? Hydra has a strong melee buff that is pretty much only going to be affecting weak units. And while gene stealers are well positioned to hit above their weight class, as I have made clear, Kraken is going to have an easier time getting the most of them. And let's be honest, if you're playing Hydra, Gaunts, Gants, Gargoyles, and Turvagons are the creatures you want to be using since they have the board presence. To that end, Blood of Bale actually provided an interesting mechanic for Hydra. The Psychic Power Death Shriek actually enables a kind of mechanic similar to Zerg Banglings for Hydra, in that it provides Hydra, a faction which specializes in making low strength units hit more reliably, a method to deal damage to high toughness targets. But the practical of it is too restrictive. It being a Psychic Power makes it something that can be negated, which for a mechanic that is already relying on you to roll 6s greatly reduces its efficacy. I think that mechanic has some real legs, it just needs to get sorted out. This also applies to their Endless Swarm stratagem. Either change it to make it function like Tide of Traitors for low tier Gaunts and Gants, or change it entirely, but definitely don't leave it in a state where it's only valid for narrative play. Actually, I think Kronos is pretty well off. The only thing is its trait doesn't speak at all to their anti-warp nature. Maybe the range of their shadow in the warp could be increased by 6 inches? And lastly, I think a new Tyranid Codex has potential to provide rules for High Fleet Tiamat and High Fleet Ouroboros, two High Fleets with noteworthy lore and have defined methods of warfare. Tiamat are the only High Fleet that is actively defensive in its behavior, and their unique adaptations have been defined as having tougher than typical exoskeletons and fiercely guarding their territory. Ouroboros is alluded to being the oldest High Fleet. They specialize in aerial warfare and have resistance to conventional anti-Tyranid weaponry. On to the Tyranid units, starting with the most important of all, the Hive Tyrant. Hive Tyrants are in a weird place. They have too few attacks. My personal gripe is I would prefer if wings required more than just a trade-off of points. But most importantly, they suffer from the same issue that all targetable characters suffer from, which is dying too easily. It's a sad state of affairs for this apex predator tactical genius of a monster. And I think with a new codex, there is potential for fixing them. Here are my picks. The number of attacks are easy enough to fix. Regarding the trade-off for wings, I hold the position that it is in poor design to handle optional upgrades in this manner. Simply being cheaper isn't enough justification for not upgrading. Certainly not when you consider how important movement is, and how valuable characters are, especially so in cases where they are targetable. And we have seen this to be true. Throughout 8th edition we have seen it with captains and jump packs, and demon princes and hive tyrants with wings. 
and now we are probably going to see it with Primaris Chaplains and Primaris Chaplains on bikes. For these kinds of options, rather than being treated as an upgrade, it should be treated as a trade. The upgrade for mobility and the accompanying perks should come at the cost of a benefit, because if that is the case, a mechanical justification can be made for either option. In the case of our Walking Hive Tyrant, I think a simple solution would be to grant Walking Tyrants the ability to fire one of its biocannons twice at the same target. It allows the Walking Hive Tyrant to better leverage ranged weapons the way the Flying One can for melee weapons. The fragility of Tyrants is a much tougher nut to crack, although the 9th edition terrain rules certainly help in this regard. But there should be more to the horror that is the Hive Tyrant. So I thought about all sorts of mechanisms, but they all felt so lackluster, and just didn't feel alien enough for this alpha beast of the Tyranids. And I eventually arrived at a solution I think is pretty great. And for the record, I don't think this is a potential, but I think it's worth sharing, and I wouldn't mind getting some input on the concept. So consider the following. Hive Tyrants, in lore, are effectively immortal beings. When slain, they are simply reconstituted back onto the battlefield. Which I know from a gameplay perspective sounds inherently broken, but like with anything, it's in the execution. And surely it would require some playtesting, but here's the concept. This mechanic would be tied to a stratagem, and only the Warlord Hive Tyrant should be able to be reconstituted. Then in the subsequent move phase, your Hive Tyrant can be set up in the same manner as a unit arriving from strategic reserves. Which is an important distinction because, firstly, if you are having a rough go of it and the enemy is all up in your deployment zone, you can arrive into combat. And secondly, it greatly lessens the potency of the resurrection utility when compared to similar resurrection type abilities, which typically keep the slain model within the vicinity of its death. But you might be asking what about the Swarm Lord? How does he factor into this? And I would say, well the Swarm Lord can work in the same manner he currently does, but I would opt for the inclusion of a stratagem which enables the Swarm Lord to be spawned into the battlefield dynamically. Which I think is quite fitting, since the Swarm Lord is a reaction to perceived threat, and when your Warlord Hive Tyrant is slain, you can instead choose to reconstitute the Swarm Lord. And regarding everyone's favorite Swarm Lord ability Hive Commander, the one that lets a unit move in the shooting phase and is synonymous with slingshotting gene stealers into the enemy deployment zone turn 1, well, in my imaginary rules paradigm, that would be a command available to players in that adaptive command matrix I mentioned in the Army Wide Rules segment. Sidebar before moving on. Upon writing out this script, I'm starting to like this a bit more, and I think this Hive Command Matrix could be tied to the presence of Hive Tyrants. The Hive Command Matrix abilities could be limited to a single unit within 6 inches of a Synapse unit. The ability to shift nodes can be a stratagem used in the command phase, or freely performed by a Hive Tyrant. This makes a great deal of sense to me, since, from the narrative point of view, the presence of the Hive Tyrant is supposed to completely alter the Swarm's behavior so it seems like a great fit. And it also flexes the Tyranids' ability to tactically adapt, an element of the Tyranids that isn't well represented through any rules or mechanics. Alright, enough pretend rules fabrication for me. I am done. Let's move on. The legendary monster that ravaged Kalth deserves a legendary rule set worthy of his reputation. Currently, Old One-Eye feels more like a Carnifex Prime. Personally, I am a fan of the old house rule that the model does not get removed from play when it's slain. Where it dies, it remains, and is non-interactable. Then, at the start of your opponent's turn, he can get back up with one wound remaining, regaining functionality. It would require some changes to account for such an ability, like not being able to control objectives, and yes, having him revive in the opponent's turn means they can just slap him back down. But that's kind of the point. It forces enemy players to dedicate a unit to deal with this monster. And maybe that route is too out of the box, which it might well be. But I'm sure you will agree that he is a named character with a lackluster rule set, and as a named character, he should be respected. Put some respect on my name. Gene Stealers are fine. I just have a thing about invulnerable saves being used for abilities which are describing how hard something is to hit. Simply put, Lictors are vanguard organisms. They literally act as scouting units for the High Fleet. I mean, it's right there in the literature, specifically adapted to fill a scout role. The Hidden Hunter ability does offer a thematic deployment option for the assassin aspect of the Lictor, which is good, but the absence of a vanguard style deployment option means this vanguard organism is literally arriving late to the party. 
And I get it, Hidden Hunter implies the Lictor was always there, lurking around. But let's look at this from a game mechanics point of view. Being able to forward deploy would provide Tyranids with valuable utility which ought to be present in their toolkit, and the ability to vanguard deploy is quite suitable for the elite unit that is the Lictor. And when comparing it to Space Marines, which have three units which provide this utility, in the troops role no less, I think it's justified. Regarding the Death Leaper, although Blood of Bale did provide Lictors a method to add one to charge rolls and ignore Overwatch, the requirement of the Lictor having to be within the terrain feature is way too restrictive in my opinion. The Death Leaper is THE Tyranid Assassin, and I think it deserves rules comparable to an Imperial Assassin. Charges need to be more reliable, either more dice like the Eversaur, or the ability to charge from a closer distance like the Calidus. And in combat, the Death Leaper should easily kill characters without defensive abilities. So bump up the points cost, it's fine by me, but the presence of the Death Leaper in a list should be a factor opponents must consider when determining their strategy, at least to the same level the presence of an Imperial Assassin would. Maliceptors are supposed to have devastatingly powerful psychic abilities, but when you look at the numbers, you can see that the Maliceptor is a poor fighter, Psychic Overload is an underwhelming and short-range ability, which worsens as it degrades, which altogether results in Psychic Overload being harder to pull off and doing less damage than casting Smite and Psychic Scream. So here's a simple idea for improvement. If you want the Maliceptor to be poor in combat, change Psychic Overload from the short-range ability it is, and make it function from a reasonable distance doing the devastating damage it's supposed to. I get that it's supposed to evoke the Psychic Tendrils, slaying all who are near it, but it requires melee levels of logistics, it leans so much on rolling well, and you can't cast any other powers, and it leaves you in a bad position. I actually don't have anything bad to say about Spore Mines. I think they're awesome. They're totally weird looking and mechanically unique relative to the conventions across Imperium units, which successfully achieves the alien horror elements I spoke to in the beginning of this video. And we arrive at Tyrannocytes. Simply make them like drop pods, giving them access to bring things down turn one. If drop pods have the exception in the new Space Marines Codex, I see no reason why the Tyranid drop pod should be exempted. For the record, this should have been FAQ'd when Space Marines got their second 8th edition codex, but we can just add more red to GW's ledger. Massive Scything Talons and Massive Crushing Claws are terrible at d6 damage. Previously I had made the case that even for ranged, single-shot heavy weapons, such as last cannons, dealing d6 variable damage is lame. Simply that for a weapon that is designed to be heavy hitting and powerful, to provide a resulting damage of 1 feels bad. Now take that feeling and multiply it by 1 billion, because that's how it feels when it happens in melee combat and the failure to perform comes with a much worse consequence. And I know it's a dice game, but game mechanics should not be what causes players to feel bad in a game's experience. That's actually the mark of poor design. Players feeling bad as a result of a game experience should be the result of poor decision making on behalf of that player. And in my opinion, only the most bizarro wacky weapons, like a bonkers orc gun, should have variability to that degree. Across the monster bioforms there are two types of scything talon and crushing claw. Massives, which are low quality, and Monstrous, which are high quality. And with all Space Marines going up to a 2 wound standard, all factions need to have access to options that provide 2 damage. So why not just set the massive weapons to deal 2 damage flat? And Emperor be damned, why is a Crushing Claw the same AP as a Scything Talon? There are no AP4 melee weapons for the Tyranids. Crushing Claws are a great place to provide that. And lastly, I really like the adaptive physiology system, and I hope that an update to this system would see each Hive Fleet have an exclusive physiology. To you know, let them adapt units to synergize with their specializations. For example, High Fleet Jormungandr could take a unit like a Tyrannofex and adaptive physiology it so it could have burrowing claws, enabling that unit to better work with their toolkit. Well, that was longer than usual. Thanks for watching. These were my thoughts on the state of Tyranids and their 9th edition potentials. I hope you found this video both interesting and enjoyable. So what do you guys think? I'm sure you would agree that the areas I mentioned are due for some upgrades, but were there any I missed? Tyranids are a faction I have quite a bit of passion for, 
so I was keen to share my opinions on the design philosophy I see for them, and many of the other facets of the faction. And to that end, hopefully they see some attention sometime in the next year. Geez, that's an insane thing to say out loud, but there it is. Well, it's probably best not to end the video on a negative note, so if you don't like how the Tyranid rules are currently, and you don't like that you have to wait an unknown, indeterminate amount of time for updates, you can always house rule any adjustment you like. If you enjoyed this video, there's a like button. And if you want to help this channel grow, there is also a subscribe button. There's also a bell button and a share button. So press the buttons you want to press. Thanks again for watching, and I will hope to see you guys in the next one. Stop playing with my name. I ain't gonna say it no more.